There are various difficult scriptures that uh, we have in the Bible, and among those are also several verses in the book of Romans or the epistle of Romans written by the Apostle Paul. Now, it's time really to finally explain all those difficult scriptures throughout the Bible. So, let's start with <coughs> the book of Romans that many people sadly twist and uh, construct something uh, construct something that is not there, read in the Bible things that are not there, and so on. So we are now in the book of Romans, and let's see Romans. And we can start with chapter 1 in Romans, and verse 4. Here is the verse which says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now why is this? scripture difficult? Well, because many wonder whether Christ was the Son of God before his resurrection from the dead. Now, this verse, friends, is easy to misread in English because it contains a Hebraism. It states, and declared to be, in parenthesis to be, and declared in parenthesis to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, the question is, what is being translated? Because in Hebrew, you say, man of sin, or man of patience, or son of power. That's the way how we would phrase things in Hebrew. In Romans 1.4, it says, with power. But, you know, this with power in Romans 1.4 does not refer to how it is declared. It is not declared with power. It is declared to be the son of God with power power. So the power of the Son of God is what is being declared. So this expression means powerful Son of God. Now in the flesh, Christ was a physical descendant of King David. The resurrection added power to him. Another example should clarify the Hebrew construction translated into English. For example, the battle declared a general with unusual strategic powers. The powers of the general were declared by the battle, not that the battle declared him a general. He was a general before the battle, you see. That is what the point is. So we have this Hebraism here in Romans that may confuse people and lead them to wrong conclusion. Finally, friends, we need to realize something, and that is that the New Testament was written in colloquial Greek, and thus the Hebra Hebraism was not interpreted. A literal Greek expression was given instead. That is why people may misunderstand Romans 1 verse 4. The next scripture that people misunderstand commonly is Romans 3 chapter 20, uh, that's chapter 3 that is, and verse 28, which reads, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now many use this verse to try to prove that the law has been done away, or at least that we don't have to keep the law since we are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, we must remember that although people say you don't have to keep the law, they really don't mean that literally. They don't mean this literally, do they? I mean, do they mean that you can kill or steal or murder without impunity? Well, no, of course not. What they do mean is that you can break the Sabbath, not tithe, and not keep God's holidays, etc. That's what they mean when they say you don't have to keep the law. But we are to remember this when we explain such verses, so if need be, we can point out this inconsistent and hypocritical stance toward the law. Paul was saying that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. He is not preaching that the law is done away. Now, being justified means to be brought into right standing before God. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 tells us that no man shall be justified by the deeds of the law. It says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Exactly. You see, the law defines sin. It tells us what sin is, but it does not and cannot take away the penalty for previous violations. Obeying the law in the future does not pay for past guilt. If a man commits a crime, his obedience to the civil law in the future does not make him any less guilty of his past offense. Now in Romans 3 and verse 28, Romans 3 verse 28 does not say 
the deeds of the law are not necessary. It doesn't say anywhere. The subject under discussion is justification and whether the deeds of the law can justify a person. Now, being justified in the biblical sense means being made just or right before God, which means having our sins forgiven and completely blotted out. The question being settled is not, should we keep the law, but rather, does present obedience to the law somehow brings a person into a right standing before God and make up for past sins? The passage in Romans chapter 3, verse 24 and 25, explains how we are justified. We are justified by God's grace through the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Christ was a propitiation, a sacrifice that reconciles, that's what it means, propitiation. So he was a propitiation for us to God. By his sacrifice, our past sins are remitted. Now, if a man commits a crime, again... His obedience to the law in the future does not make him any less guilty of his past offense. Now this is also true of us spiritually, brethren. Paul showed in Romans 3.20 that the deeds of the law do not justify anyone. And he went on to explain in Romans 3 verses 24 through 27 that justification, which means forgiveness of sins that are past, which is in Romans 3.25, so the justification can come only by grace through Christ's sacrifice. Most certainly, it cannot come by keeping or having any deeds of the law. Now, once we are reconciled to God, we must keep the commandments if we are to remain justified. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, being justified by faith does not mean we do away with or make void the law. On the contrary, as it says in Romans 3, 31, we establish the law. Once our sins are forgiven, we are able to receive God's Holy Spirit, which He gives to those who obey Him. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, is that established. This Spirit gives us the love of God, Romans 5, 5, which is keeping of His commandments, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. So the conclusion is Romans 3, 28. That conclusion says that we are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Without, in authorized version, could be more clearly translated apart from or outside of. So apart from or outside of the deeds of the law, we are being, of, co of course, indeed justified by faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Then the next difficult scripture in Romans might be chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, friends, Abraham is called the father of the faithful. Yet the scriptures record that he lied on at least two occasions. Some believe that these acts show a lack of faith on Abraham's part. Well... In Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8, God called Abraham a friend. We see that in Isaiah 41 verse 8. Yet Abraham was only human, just like we all are, and on occasion under duress, he stumbled spiritually. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 8, we read about that human condition. But however, throughout his long life, while undergoing many severe tests, the one dominant characteristic that motivated Abraham was his absolute faith in God. Hebrews 11 is a perpetual testimony to his resounding faith. And in Genesis, however, 26 verse 5, yes, it says that in faith, Abraham obeyed my, which is God's, voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Dear friends, what a tremendous example. And by the way, notice, he obeyed God's voice before Moses, kept his God's charge before Moses, kept God's commandments before Moses and his statutes and his laws, which means that the laws of God are not, did not come with Moses, but they precede Moses and the house of Israel, which left Egypt. So Abraham was the one who did this. And we have that in Genesis 26 verse 5. What a tremendous example.
But there were times, however, when Abraham was unduly influenced by circumstances, by foolish counsel of others, and by his own fear of men. Abraham's lies are recorded in Genesis 12, verses 18 through 20, and Genesis 20, verse 2. Under pressures of the moment, Abraham at times yielded to human reason, and he sinned, like we read in Proverbs 40, verse 12. He was not always at his best spiritually. He, too, had his moments of weaknesses and lessons to learn. But though Abraham was not exempted from human error, God forgave him and looked upon his life in its totality and judged him faithful and righteous, worthy of eternal life. Now, for these reasons, we read in James 2, verse 23, for these reasons, the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, for he was called the friend of God. Unlike most people, when Abraham heard the voice of God, he listened he listened and obeyed, dear friends. He indeed, like Romans 4 verse 11 says, he indeed is the father of all of them that believe. We are in Romans and we are analyzing the difficult scriptures that we find in that book. And there are, of course, other difficult scriptures throughout the Bible that we are going to cover in the coming months. So here is another difficult scripture in Romans uh, chapter 6 verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. This is one of the most favorite scriptures in the Protestant world. Now, and in that world, many point to this verse to try to prove that we don't have to keep the law or that it has been done away. Specifically, the argument here is that we don't have to obey the law because we are under grace, not under law. Now, do the followers of Christ have to obey the law? That's the question. Well, Paul was talking to Roman converts who had repented and turned from sin. We see that in Romans chapter 6, verse 17. They had become baptized and they were living a new way of life following God's laws, Romans 6, verse 4. At baptism, the old sinful man was crucified with Jesus Christ, Romans 6, 6, and buried with him, Romans 6, verse 4. A new person living God's way of life instead of the life of, of the life of sin is resurrected from the water. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 and 6. We must remember that although people say you don't have to keep the law, they really don't mean that this literally. Do they mean you can kill or steal or murder or with impunity? No, of course not. We already said that. No. What they do mean is that you can break the Sabbath, not tithe and not keep God's holidays, etc. We are to remember this every time when we explain such verses. So if need be, we can point out this inconsistent and hypocritical stance toward the law. This scripture does not say we don't have to obey the law. It does say we are not under the law, but under grace. The term under the law refers to being under the penalty of the law, not under the jurisdiction of the law. When we sin which means when we break God's law, like in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it is described. So when we sin, when we break God's law, the law has a claim over our lives. Romans 6, verse 23. We are then under the law, under its penalty. It is the sinner who is under the law. On the other hand, when we repent and receive God's grace made possible through the sacrifice of Christ, we are pardoned and the penalty of death is taken away. Then we are no longer under the law. In other words, we are no longer under the penalty of death for having broken the law. Now, does this give us free license to sin? That is to break the law because we are under grace and not under the law. You see, Paul asks this very question in Romans 6 verse 15 and answers it by saying, God forbid... It is like a condemned murderer on death row waiting for execution. At the last minute, the governor grants him a pardon. He is now a free man, but does that, that does not mean that he is at liberty to murder again. That would be absurd. His pardon covers only the past offense, not future crimes. So repentant, baptized followers of Christ, striving to live God's way of life instead of a life of sin, are not under the dominion of the law, 
the penalty for their sins, the penalty was paid for them by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They are therefore no longer under the penalty of the law, which is death, but they are now under grace. And speaking about that, let's just elaborate a bit more. Our past sins are covered by Christ's shed blood. They are totally forgotten by God since Christ paid the death penalty for us. We read about that in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12 and verse 14. Also we are justified, meaning forgiven of our past sins by grace. Romans 3 verse 24 and Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 and 8. But grace also is a gift of God. It is undeserved, as we read in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 28, and John chapter 1, verse 17. Once the penalty for our past sins has been paid by Christ, and we are no longer under the penalty of the law, it does not mean that we no longer have to follow the law in the future. Because God's law defines sin. It shows us what sin is. We read about it in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Romans 4, 15, Romans 5, verse 13, and Romans 7, verses 7 and 8. We should not continue in sin once we have been forgiven for past sins. Romans 6, and verse 15, Romans 3, verse 31, and Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. And also the hearers of the law will not remain justified before God, only the doers of the law, says Romans chapter 2, verse 13. Now many other scriptures tell a follower of Christ that the doing of the law is what is important. Not hearing, but doing of the law. We read about that from Christ's words in Matthew, for example, chapter 7, verse 26. We read in James, about the James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, in First John chapter 3, verse 7, and in James chapter 2, verse 21. If we do not continue to follow God's law, we will certainly not remain justified. <laughs> and of course, we'll not be justified. We certainly cannot inherit the eternal life and we cannot, you know, be saved. Now let's go to Romans chapter 7. Here in verse 4, here is another difficult scripture which we want to explain once for all. Romans 7 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now many claim this verse does away with the law of God. <laughs> it's just amazing how much people hate the law of God and they want to do it away, or they just have good intention and say, well, but we're free from that law because we're free in Christ. Well, let us notice carefully what Paul says in Romans 7, 4. He says, You have become dead. That's the New King James Version. He did not say, The law is dead. You have become dead. The law of God did not perish, but the people became dead to the law by the body of Christ. Then in the next verse, Romans 7, 5, it helps explain. He says, For when we were in the flesh... Meaning before we were converted and while we were living according to the pulls of the flesh. So when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were revealed for what they are by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So thus, when we were yet sinners, we were worthy of death in God's sight, having transgressed his holy law, brethren. But now, Paul writes further, we are now in Romans 7 verse 6, Paul says, But now we have been delivered from certain death penalty of the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Well, that is what it is. So Christ paid the penalty in our stead. The law of God no longer claims our lives. You see, while sinners... We were worthy of execution, but now Paul says we are dead to the law. That is, we are dead to the penalty of death. The penalty of death has been paid by Jesus Christ. So we are dead to the law. The law has no claims over our lives again, uh, uh, still or again. So, uh, far, uh, so far as the law is concerned, the penalty is paid. We are dead in Christ and there is no further date with death for us if we continue to live in Christ. So this verse, contrary to the common, commonly held views, this verse in no way says that the law is done away. 
It merely shows that Christ paid the penalty of the law for us. How? Well, he died for us. So we are dead with him, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, and no longer does condemnation await us, Romans 8, 1, because we are also made spiritually alive with him through his resurrection, as it says in Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 and verse 11. Then in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, here is another difficult scripture which says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Now, many point to this verse to try to prove that the law has been done away again. Specifically, the argument here is that Christ put an end to law-keeping. Now, do followers of Christ then have to obey the law? That's the question. Well, the English word end is translated from the Greek telos, meaning the result, outcome, or conclusion of an act or state. And this is totally different meaning from termination, which the English word end can mean. Paul is talking about the Israelites, we see that in Romans 10 verse 2, and their self-righteousness, we see that in Romans 10 verse 3. Now the house of Israel did not attain the law of righteousness because they sought it by their works, meaning by their self-righteousness, instead of by faith as we read in Romans chapter 9, verse 31 and 32. The Jews added many restrictive laws of their own to the laws of God. Because of their self-righteousness, they felt they did not need Jesus Christ. Now, if God's law ended, we wouldn't know what sin is. Because the law defines sin. We know that from Romans chapter 3, verse 20, chapter 4, verse 15, chapter 5, verse 13, and chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. So if God's law ended, we wouldn't know what sin is. The law defines sin, and there would be no sin, because sin is the transgression of the law, as it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And if there was, there was no sin, because the law ended, there would be no need for Christ or his sacrifice. You see how uh, uh, absurd are the various claims by today's churchianity. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 is another difficult scripture because it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now some have had misgivings about pledging allegiance to the flag or have believed that saluting the flag is idolatrous. Some people in America. Well, however, since the words one nation under God are used, Americans are certainly free to take this pledge. It is then understood that their allegiance is pledged only so far as they are not forced to disobey God's laws. Now the Bible commands us to be good citizens of the country in which we live. We know God has set government over all human beings and every follower of Christ should, as it says in Romans 13, 1, be subject unto the higher powers. This is with the understanding that our greater, higher, first allegiance belongs to God. A similar question involves saluting the flag. Well, that's present in various other countries, not only in the States, because some believe that saluting the flag is idolatrous. However, while saluting is not in itself an act of worship, but it's merely a matter of showing respect. And uh, through the Apostle Paul, God commands us in Romans 13 verses 1 through 7, uh, God commands us to render respect and honor when they are Due. So Americans and others who salute the flag, they, they, they do that not because it is the symbol of another god, but because it stands for the freedom and blessings which the most high, most high god has given Americans in particular. Romans chapter 14, verse 5 and 6 is indeed another difficult scripture that to understand and we are going to end our Useful short study of that with Romans 14 uh, and verse 5 and 6. We'll continue to analyze other difficult scriptures in the months to come. Romans 14 verse 5. One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day regards it unto the Lord. And he that regards not the day, to the Lord he does not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he, for he gives thanks 
uh, he gives God thanks, and he that eats not to the Lord, he eats not and gives God thanks. Now many have questions about this passage, as it seems to say that it makes no difference to God which days we keep holy. Oh, it does make a huge difference because from the very creation, as we read in Genesis chapter 2, from the very, very creation of the whole world, God, God sanctified and set apart only one day, the seventh day, in which he rested and gave us example to follow. And no wonder on that very seventh day, he held the first uh, services, because obviously he was having to teach the first humans what his requirements, what his law, what his ways are. In any case, many have questions because it says, you know, it it seems to say that it doesn't matter, you know, whatever law we keep. But no, these these things, these instructions, actually related to the various customs in the Greek speaking world of that time. So actually, these verses do not concern any day which we must keep. And that must be kept holy. This is proved by the context of an, of the entire chapter. The context, you see. Because Paul admonished the saints at Rome to receive the weak in the faith. Romans 14.1 And not to sit in judgment of them. Because some of those recently converted, not yet having grown strong in the faith, refused to eat meat and subs- subsisted mainly, basically lived on vegetables. So Paul explains now why, in another one of his letters, most of the available meat had been offered to idols at that time, you see. Before going to the market, they would be offering them to the idols at various pagan temples, and then they would go to the market. So the the, the, uh, conscience uh, of some was defiled. He explains that he explains that in uh, his letter to Corinthians, conscience of some were defiled because they were thinking like that they were sacrificing to the idols and eating and honoring uh, pagan gods by eating such meat. Well, that's not that was not the case. We know that idols is nothing and uh, that it should not affect our lives. Paul writes in another epistle, in uh, epistle to First Corinthians. We are going to analyze that in due time. So. Most of the available meat had been offered to idols, unlike the vegetables that were not. So some Gentiles who had been converted and had come out of idolatry still held some superstitious beliefs, because they thought that idols actually had power over their lives. And therefore, as it says in First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, Some with conscience of the idol ate meat as a thing offered unto an idol. So it would be defiling their conscience. But we know also from James that whatever is not done in good conscience it is sin and it should not be done now but why did paul break into his dissertation about eating meat or refraining from eating it and mention day why did he mention day well notice the answer is in new king james translation of the passage which is which is rendered like this one person esteems one day above another Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, there we are, eating is the context, friends and brethren, not which day are we we obligated to keep holy. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God things, and he who does not eat to the Lord, He does not eat and gives God thanks. This is passage from Romans 14, verse 5 and 6. Now, not only were there weak converts who were afraid of eating meat offered to idols, but there were others who customarily abstained from a particular food. They practiced a semi-fast or abstained from foods on certain days. And this, brethren, is still present in the uh, mainly in the Orthodox Christian Orthodox world. They have a, when they have a semi Lent or Lent, they would have a strict uh, rules what is being consumed each day. Whether something is to be cooked on oil, the other day has to be cooked only on water. The third, well, the, 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 the strictest fasting they think is when they don't eat anything but only drink water. In any case, this was now the custom of many in the Greek-speaking world, and then when they got converted, you know, they customarily abstained from a particular food. 
and uh, they would abstain from foods on certain days. Certain foods they would eat. I don't know. They would not eat, for example, fish. They would eat fish on a Friday and stuff like that. But you see, others, other believers, regarded all days alike as far as eating was concerned. So the whole matter involved abstention on particular days. So the question was, to eat or not to eat? You know, it was merely a question of the days upon which many voluntarily abstained from certain foods. Now, Paul was not referring to God's holidays, and there is nothing here referring to the Sabbath. Sabbath is not even mentioned. Eating is mentioned. Now, Jesus said that we should fast before God and not be seen or let it be known by others unnecessarily. That's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Uh, but however, Jews and Gentiles, they both practice semi-fasts on particular days or, uh, of each week or each month. For example, the Jews at that time customarily fasted twice in the week. We know that from Luke chapter 18, verse 12. They also fasted during certain months, like it's written in Zechariah chapter 7, verse 4 through 7. One of those months is the uh, ninth of Ab, the date when Jerusalem was destroyed twice in its history. Jews also fasted during certain months. We have just read it in Zechariah chapter 7. And the Jews were divided on the matter. The Gentiles also were divided over when to abstain from certain foods. And these things are all mentioned in Hastings' Encyclopedia of Religious Religion and Ethics. Now in God's sight, it does not you know, really matter when one abstains or fasts. But it does matter that we do it with a right heart. Paul wanted the brethren to live at peace with one another and not argue or judge each other over human over their human opinions. So the Bible elsewhere teaches very plainly which days God made holy and commanded us to keep holy. That will be in Leviticus chapter twenty three. 